Hello, and welcome to another installment of At The Podium with me, Patrick Huey. At The Podium is a platform where we will learn from people who come from different walks of life, careers, and experiences, but all share one thing in common. They have stepped fully into the transformative power of saying yes to the unexpected turns of their lives. And they're now using the power of their voice or podium to make an impact on the world we live in today. At the podium is the intersection of art, culture, and big thoughts wrapped up in good old fashioned conversation. Today, I'm thrilled and humbled to share the podium with Tembi Locke. Tembi Locke is a TV producer, actor, author, and screenwriter with a passion for connecting with an audience both on the page and on the screen. Her memoir, From Scratch, a memoir of love, Sicily, and Finding Home is a 2019 Reese's Book Club pick and New York Times bestseller, and she is currently adapting the book as a limited series for Netflix with Hello Sunshine. She is an accomplished actor with over 60 film and television credits and currently recurring on Never Have I Ever. Off screen, Tembi is a nationally recognized speaker for her keynotes on resilience, loss, and motherhood. Her TEDx talk has been viewed by individuals and nonprofits worldwide. Through her work, she aims to inspire people to embrace resilience, love, and the power of community. Tembi, welcome to At The Podium. Hi, Patrick. It's so good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm excited for our conversation today. It's been a conversation that's been decades in the making, I feel like, whenever we have a chance to talk, Tembi. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a version of this conversation, if I can put forward right from the top, that we've known each other for a very long time. I will not enumerate <laughs> the years, but let's just suffice it to say a very long time. And I think to some degree, we've been having a version of a conversation like this for many years, since probably we first met as kids. I mean, when I say kids, teens, you know, I mean, it was a teenage version of that conversation. <laughs> Right. I think so. I think we have. And I think that's been one of the really beautiful things about our friendship is that it's really been a, con a, a, a friendship that's based on the exchange of ideas. Um, and we can, you know, we can go high and speak art and speak, you know, future and politics. And then it's sometimes just really good laughter. And I yeah. think, I think the beauty of friendships that last for so long is that they really are, it's, it's a crown of joy on your head, right? And I think that is why I value our friendship so much. And, and partly why for this inaugural season of At The Podium, I've reached out to people like you who I have a relationship with, some new relationships, some long-standing relationships, but people who I, I believed could be a, a source of inspiration, joy and light and understanding for this process and for what I'm trying to do here. You know, I love the way you described friendship, that it's a crown of joy on your head. That, I've never heard it said that way. It is beautiful and it captures the exact feeling of what a good, good, long-term, deep, authentic, and I say authentic friendship is. It's a crown of joy. It's a crown of joy. And I think, you know, and the, the beauty of this particular moment is that this moment would not have happened unless you had connected me to the team of people that I work with for At The Podium. And so there's so many full circle moments that are happening in this conversation today, which I'm, I'm publicly saying how grateful to you I am for introducing me to Corinne and to Marianne, because you, you saw it, you saw it. And you were like, you need to meet these people. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you know, this is, I have said, this is your dharma. This is your this is your path. It is you and your excellence. And so I love being a, I, I'm, I'm honored to be a part of it today, but I'm loving watching it blossom and grow and seeing you do your work. It's just gorgeous. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's get into it. 
I have so many questions for you, but I want to start almost five years ago. It's been about five years, I believe, Timby. You sat down and you wrote from scratch and it becomes a New York Times bestseller. And I see on your Instagram feed and your social media accounts that you have literally inspired people around the world with your story. And now you're bringing that story to Netflix with major players involved, like Reese Witherspoon's Hello Sunshine and Zoe Saldana. Did you have the slightest inkling of what your story and your book would unleash in the world and in your life? Um, no. The short answer <laughs> is no. <laughs> well, and you're right, it was uh, five years ago, actually it was five years ago around this, we're in January now, so it's 2017. And I knew that, and I will just say right now, full disclaimer, I will get emotional, I'm sure during many parts of this, that is just me, roll with it. <laughs> It's all good, um, but I, get, I, I I say that because I was starting to feel something bubble up now because five years ago, I knew I was about to approach the forthcoming um, fifth anniversary of my late husband's passing. And so I knew that the five year mark was a significant mark and I'd, all, I'd had enough grief, feral, deep grief under my belt to know that the more that time marched on, my relationship to my grief, to my story with him, to him was constantly evolving. And there was some part of me that felt if I didn't capture it right now, then I, might, I was afraid I might lose it. Or I, I would, and, and, I, and I wanted to create a record for myself, for my daughter, and I wanted to heal. And so I kind of said, it was January, and I remember thinking like, okay, I think this is the year I need to write all this. I think I, this is the year I need to write a book. I need to attempt, to, I'm going to attempt to write a book. I'm going to attempt to put this, oh my gosh, I'm going to attempt to put this in a book. And I, it kind of came to me super clear. And then I sat on it for two months because I was scared. And when March, which is the month he passed away, when March of 2017 came around, I reached out to uh, my sister and I said, I've written an essay would you read this essay for me? And my thinking at the time was that perhaps if I wrote this essay, I could, you know, get it published somewhere. I don't know, like online, on Medium. I wasn't sure. I had no clear path. But I was like, I think this essay is the, the key that will open the door to maybe me getting an, an agent or, you know, get, garnering some interest in this story that I want to become a book. So I shared the essay with my sister. My sister said, um, this is beautiful. And may I, and I let me just say right now, my sister is an accomplished, for those who don't know, my sister is Attica Locke, who is an accomplished New York Times bestselling, award-winning novelist, uh, critically acclaimed. And she's also a screenwriter. And you're gonna hear her name, I'm sure, throughout this conversation because she's also a collaborator and partner. Um, but she shared it with her manager, her lit manager. He read it and he said, do you have more? And I said, well, yeah, I do have more than just this essay. He said, because I think this is a book. And of course, you know, I knew that because I was thinking this is a book. And he said, give me a proposal. And I had been tinkering with a book proposal for many years off and on. Like I'd pick it up for three weeks at a time and I'd get stuck and I'd put it away. And I'd pick it up and I'd put it, write some more and then I'd stick it away. And now I had a manager, a literary per professional saying, hey, let's present this. And so long story short, took six weeks. And on Mother's Day of 2017, so I took this very interesting Mother's Day weekend. I say that with great intentionality. Um, the book proposal went out and I, with, by Monday there was interest and um, and then I took the next year and I wrote the hell out of it. I wrote to the best of my ability, not knowing. And I really, I think this is a very long-winded way of coming back to your original question, which is, did I think it would change my life? No. I mean, I knew it would change my life insofar as I would be fulfilling a heartfelt desire yeah. and I would be being honest and true and authentic and honoring of my deepest creative intention 
So I knew that on a personal level, it was going to transform my life. Mm. And I wrote myself a letter when the book sold and once the ink was dry on the contract, because, you know, I come from the acting world where until you have the contract and you're on set in the costume and then it airs, it's not a real thing. So even though I knew the book had been sold, I didn't believe the book had been sold until I had a contract in hand. And so once I had the contract in hand, I said, okay. Um, I wrote myself a letter um, because that's the kind of thing I do. (laughs) I wrote myself a letter and in the letter, and I don't have it in front of me, but it essentially said, you know, I I hope to write the best book that I was capable of writing. And I think I put in there whether five people read this or 50 or God, I couldn't even have imagined like, you know, 500, like was like my top, I was like, oh my God, 500 people, I'd read my book, like, whoa, you know. that as long as I served the love and attempted to do that as much as I could, then I would be happy. So I had no idea Reese Witherspoon would come along in my life, read the manuscript early on, choose it for her book club. I had no idea that we would then be approached to adapt it. And I say we, meaning my sister um, and I, to adapt it and that Netflix would buy it and that then we'd spend the next two years, um, which you know brings us to now, or almost three years now, um, developing it, scripting it, writer's room, putting it on its feet, and now editing. And and it, I'm humbled every friggin' day, every friggin' day, like <laughs> that this is a thing that and the term, the thing that comes to me is love that love has a way. And I say that with, because listen, we managed to make this series in the middle of a global pandemic. Yeah. This book came forth in the world six months before the world shut down. And the book is about grief. It is about loss. It is about death. It is about love. It is about rebirth. It is about family. It is about parenting. It is about motherhood. It is about place and home. And I had no idea all of those things would be global themes that we were thinking about and are thinking about as we all navigate this pandemic. So that was not me, (laughs) you know, like foretelling, you know, I had no sense of that, but it, it, it sort of came in the world at the right time. And I think that is a part of what has allowed it to take root, to expand, to grow one by one, one person sharing with another person sharing it with another person that it has expanded. And now it's, um, you know, going to be on screen. There is something in the book that speaks to, and you alluded to this a moment ago, to the moment. And I think that is what has given it a life beyond what you would typically see in a book. And I think that's what's given it the legs to run on so beautifully because all of those themes are specific to your experience that you experienced over this time of your life, this love and this great loss and everything in between. But those feelings, those emotions are literally written for, and I, and I say this in all the greatness of this word, those words are written for the epic that we're living through right now. We are in we are we are in biblical territory and those emotions are they live on the page in your book because the love was so deep the loss was so unexpected and so profound so we are all wrestling with those questions today the the questions of who we are in our humanity are fully on the table right now mm-hmm. and i think the story of of you and Sato was the question, can this love work? And then it did. And then the other question, which is, can I go on? Can you go on? And can love stay with me? I mean, I think that, you know, what I know about storytelling both from, you know, years as an actor and 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 you know, having written a book and now having having written the series, you know, you're answering a question. You know, every story starts with, and, you know, we would call it an inciting incident, right? That puts forth a kind of a question. 
And the essential question of the book was how do I hold on to what I had and where does it go, right? And I think that is a fundamental existential question that I, at the time that I was living through it after his passing in 2012, and you know, certainly in the writing of it, I felt was my, I was not the first person who had been through that clearly, but I felt like that was my, that was my private question I was wrestling with and that I was seeking to answer on the page. Now it's a question we all are in. We are all living that question up front. So I am kind of in company, right? <laughs> with, we're all in company together around it. And I think that is one of the reasons why it, 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 when people pick it up now, it has a kind of a different meaning to it. Right, right. It, it's, able, it's able to, to live past the sort of particulars of the plot of the story, which I think is the greatness of, of the novel, of the memoir itself. You mentioned earlier Attica Locke, who holds a dear place in my heart. I've known her for as long as I've known you. And, and yeah. you know, remember dancing across the stage in high school with your sister. And yes. here we sit grown people, <laughs> which makes me laugh. But she has been with you on this process yeah. from the beginning. And I wonder, what did that mean for you to have your sister bear witness to this process with you? Ooh, Patrick Huey. <laughs> I, um, well, the emotions come up for sure. I'm feeling all the feels right now, just even at the question. I think it's something I'm gonna spend a lifetime unpacking, right? this experience because it is singular, it is unique, it is in a once in a lifetime or many lifetimes kind of experience. Um, so my sister is my, you know, she's my ride or die. She's my <laughs> come hell or high water. She is my comrade in arms. Uh, she is my, you know, um, you know, we are, we are creative partners, we are life partners, and I say that with great intentionality, um, and we're best friends, you know, through all of it, right? And so she, in terms of the story and this adaptation, and even the writing of the book, I mean, I started off the story of telling you how I wrote the book by beginning with her, because she was the first person who said, no, 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 there's more here. And in fact, she was the one who said to me, if you don't write this book, she said, I'll never speak to you again. And anybody who knows my sister, knows that, that there might be some merit to that kind of a threat. And I wasn't prepared to not speak to my sister, but more to the point, it was, she said it was such conviction that I believed I had faith in myself because she had faith in me. And I think that's what our good, the good, the, the rock solid people in our lives do is they see something in us that we don't quite see and they call it forward. They name it, they say, go for it. And then they stand by you as you stumble your way toward it. Tembi, Tembi, I have to tell you what you yeah. just said. We shot an anthropodium yesterday with a gentleman named Brian Williams. We shot an anthropodium a few weeks ago with my sister, Kiko Anderson. They said, and you just said it in your Tembi like way, that there is not a successful person on the planet who did not have a person to help them, who God did not drop in their path to shepherd them along the way. And I literally just got chills when you said that because there's something in that. Mm -hmm. It's even more wonderful and miraculous because it's your sister, but there's yeah. something in that, 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 that person who walks beside you Yes. Opens the doors for you, perhaps. Yes. Cajoles you, hugs you. Yes. Yes. That's challenges so you. Challenges you. That's so critical to our lives, and I think that's. I just wanted to remark that to you because it struck me when you said it. Yeah. No. And 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 the other thing. I mean, there are many things, but I am blessed. One, we are very very close. We have done. Uh, we have a a, a very 
you know, for us, it's not unique because it's just our relationship, but I, I am old enough in the world that I've seen enough relationships in the world to know that it is unique in terms of the way we partner, hold each other up, support each other. And so the other blessing in having her at my, one, she was at my side through all of the lived experiences that I write about in the book. So that when we come to the time and we're approached to sort of adapt it, and because she is an accomplished screenwriter as well, she was at, it was like, do you guys want to do this together with her as the you know, showrunner? You guys create it together. She, she in, a, in Hollywood, a showrunner is the person who, <laughs> you know, is kind of in charge of everything and has sort of the final say in everything, which is fantastic for my sister. She loves nothing more. <laughs> and, but is, is she, is she, and she's great at it, you know? And so then I, what together, what we could do is sort of, there's a space where we have a kind of singular voice where our two individual talents come together as one and we could hang out in that space to create the series. And I say, you know, I was thinking about it the other day and um, I think our roles of our mini roles together in going from book to series is I feel my role in this process has been kind of a guardian of the essence of the story because an adaptation in its very concept is that it is not the book. It cannot be the book. It is a separate medium. It, uh, it, it has uh, separate creative um, benchmarks that it needs to sort of you know bend to. If there are many other people involved, there's a network, there are actors, there's a whole, there's director. I mean, it's a whole other medium. And so for me, I approach the adaptation saying, okay, I, I feel that one of the things I can really bring to this is sort of keeping it as close to the essence of the original story as possible. What my sister does so brilliantly is she is the guardian of the craft. And so she understands because she has written five critically acclaimed novels. She has written and produced for television for everything from When They See Us to uh, Little Fires Everywhere to Empire. She understands the craft of television. And so she understands what needs to happen to get that story off the book page and onto the screen. And so watching her do that at a high level and then our internal conversations and sort of dialogues about, well, is it this, is it that, is it, has been so incredibly exciting. But together between the essence and the craft is where this new form of From Scratch that will land on Netflix in 2022, that's where it comes from. And I could only do that with her. I could not have the, this, this, she, because we have a kind of a shorthand where I can just give her a look and we know. <laughs> like that's a go or that's a no go, you know. And it's 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 and we can um, finish each other's sentences sometimes. When I am at a low, she can rise. When she needs a moment, I can rise. And I think that makes for a great partnership. Mm. And all of our years of being sisters and like playing together when we were little and like you know all of that and reading each other's work early in our careers and cheering cheerleading each other you know when I got my first acting job and you know she had her first television writing job or got her first book deal you know all of that has come to bear so we know how to cheerlead each other we know when the other one is struggling we can see when they're on to something and we go oh like yeah 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 go like oh let's try that there's safety right. Timby, you have been an actress since I've known you. <laughs> like <But> 14, <laughs> like when we were 14. 15 years old. <laughs> and I but, was acting in the hallways of high school. <laughs> right, right. But what, what the world may not know is that you also have incredible skills as a photographer, hmm. and a painter. And in, in the bio that I read for today, you refer to yourself as an author a producer and a screenwriter, in addition to being an actress. And I wanna know how your creative and personal voyage over the last 15 years has expanded your notion of who you are and in the ways that you contribute to the world because it's so much broader than where yeah, we started. I know, and I, you know, I, I, I was gonna say I struggle with that 
and what I mean by that is I think I struggle with the nomenclature. Yeah. I struggle with like assigning these titles, right? And if I really say all the things, it feels like, wait, are you just stringing a bunch of words together? <laughs> like, you know, we're in this, we live in this time of like multi-hyphenates and, you know, everybody's like all these things, you know, I'm an influencer, I'm a this, I'm a that. And I'm just like, eh. you know, it feels a little pomp and circumstance, a little pretentious to me, right? So in that sense, I struggle with it, but I understand that there is a value at the personal of, of naming what you do. And, so, and, and I think it's actually essential for us as artists to name. So sometimes I actually task myself with just naming it because then I'm owning that space. I'm owning that part of me. I am not disavowing myself of whole parts of who I am. And I'm not doing that for the front facing world. I am doing that pretending. I am doing that for me because I have come to understand that I am more than one thing, that I, if I may borrow the language, contain multitudes. And, right? And so I'm, and for me at the personal level, and what that also does for me is it helps me to stay true to and to hold accountable to whole parts of who I am. Because sometimes I might be like, oh, well, you know, uh-huh, right? Because we do, we, 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 uh, and, and again, I, I will say maybe this is different for, you know, kids coming up today, or maybe it's different for other generations, but I was definitely, you know, came into the world at a time where you did the thing that you said you were going to do, you got that profession, and that's what you were, and it had a kind of singularity to it, and that was your fixed identity that you were supposed to march through the rest of your life with. Well, lo and behold, that doesn't work for anybody, <laughs> right? But there's some still vestige of that way of thinking that I find myself constantly having to challenge. So yes, I always knew that I had all of these artistic yearnings. Acting was the first place that I could express them. And I think I came to acting because one, we talk about, disavowing ourselves of whole parts of who we were, I think it's not uncommon for those of us who find ourselves on the stage or in front of a camera acting, is that we are trying to claim some part of the human experience that we don't have permission to do in our real lives. When you get to inhabit a character, you get to behave and say things that might not be okay in your normal pedestrian everyday rank and file life. And I thought that was damn exciting. The idea that I could have some other name, put on some costumes and explore the human landscape in a way that can be locked the 15, 20, you know, even 30 year old couldn't fully do. So that's how I came to acting. But as a professional actor, when I was first starting out, Patrick, I'll be real frank with you. Those times, audition to audition, job to job, when it was just a dearth, like a, a vacuous space of like, wait, who am I? Wait, what? Like, I'm not acting. I'm not, like, what? I was like, well, there's a creator in me. There's an act. There's a, there's, a, there's a creative artist in me. What can I do that speaks to my heart, that lifts, that, that sort of uh, excites my mind, that makes my heart sing? What is that thing? So I tried a lot of photography, painting. I would always take writing classes, UCLA. I would sign up for any class I could find that was like, you know, a UCLA extension class because that constant quest of, for curiosity. And I understood inherently that if I needed to keep my actor alive, my actor engaged as an artistic being in the world, it could not be tethered to what job I had or what audition I had that week. That it had to live above and beyond, right? Those sort of um, markers. And so, I picked up a camera and I was like, I could tell, I could tell stories through a camera. Oh, I can paint. And I love that stuff. And I, you know, although I have not pursued it as a quote unquote career, I've pursued it as a, as a part of my artistic life. And it, and it all has helped me. It all helped me write the book. It's all a part of the soup. It's all part of the soup. It's all part of the soup. Where did this come from? What in your life your beginning life prepared you for this life? Ooh. 
Ah, um, the first thing that comes to my mind from that question is, is, is tenacity. It's something I really, um, my, my daughter who is, um, a teen, we were, we had to record something recently for families because, you know, we're all on Zoom and we're apart and it was, it was a birthday and we were all were asked to say something about someone that we loved and everyone, all the family members and friends sent in this video. And I apparently in the, in my recording, used the word tenacious, like a tenacity, tenacious, you know, a lot. And so she said, what does that word mean for you? Because you say it a lot, mommy. And it made me think about what does that word mean? And the one thing I can say that I do think um, I got from my early life, from my grandparents, from my community of origin, from my family of origin, is a kind of persistent, dare I say dogged, <laughs> approach to um, finding a way no matter what. I, I, that's just, it's like you find a way no matter what. And I saw my great grandparent to do it because I was fortunate enough to be alive long enough to kind of know them and have them be a part of my formative years. I saw great aunts and uncles do it by extension. Um, and that was a kind of, um, if you will, family ethos, right? Well, they put a roadblock over there. Well, okay, how are we gonna go around that? Like, it, what, what, you know, that, and, and again, these are, I grew up, in Texas, my family's from, you know, mostly rural East Texas, Jim Crow era. I am the product of Jim Crow era children. And so they were about changing the world. And not just, they were not satisfied to simply change their station in life. Because there are people who, okay, it's about like, let me change my station <laughs> in my time on the planet, which I have, that is a path. This was about how do we change it for a community, for people at large. And so, and people did that in all kinds of different ways from being a teacher to pursuing professional careers to sometimes just helping out at their community church or a variety of creative ways to impact your community. That's what I saw. And I saw people use the skills that they had, the simple skills that they had to do that work. So I think what that did early on was literally show me, okay, you can not move mountains, but you can affect change. And maybe it's gonna require you to start bit by bit, piece by piece, but it will add up. Because the people in my life, the what I saw where they had to play the long game. Nobody had the benefit of the short turnaround. <laughs> I, I mean, I just didn't see that in my, like we literally, you know, we're talking like, you know, you read any of my sister's books and I think you'll understand the landscape of what it means to come out of, you know, segregated American Texas South, you know, and what that, the kinds of obstacles you are up against as a African-American family, woman, man, child at that time that teaches you a kind of nimbleness, a kind of um, way of wanting to say, how do I do what I need to do in the world? Do it in a way that helps my community, but that also preserves the essence of who I am as a person. And I, I just saw that, I, I saw that. And I, I feel blessed that I got plopped into that ecosystem of humans that were thinking about the world in that way. And I benefited from it. And I think that prepared me for now. You know, I mean, I feel like it's a long answer, but it, it may be no, it's, it's, esoteric. Um, no, it's, but it's, you asked about the formative, the early stuff. No. I mean, I could talk about like the professional ins and outs, but I'm talking about like the grant at the like, soul level like what was i seeing at 5 10 11 12 what 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 was happening you know my sister and i were talking the other day about my dad you know before his um when he was early in his law career and he was still coming out of community being a community activist then he was an attorney um in a small upstart practice 
But I remember um, when they, we had a wave of, of refugees from Haiti coming to Texas um, and no one was letting them in. And my dad with some of his community activists got together. I remember going and doing like, getting canned goods, getting hair products and brushes and women's uh, uh, pajamas together to all put together because we were gonna get, and I, I was thinking like, oh my God, what a blessing it was to have that experience as a child, like to know, and I, I couldn't have told you where Haiti was on the map, but what I saw was somebody needs some help and this is the thing I can do right now. <clears throat> I don't know if that answers the question. That, that, that does answer the question. It also, on a very real level, on just a nuts and bolts level, explains the level of success that you've been able to have in an industry where there, there, where, where the demand just doesn't meet <laughs> all the supply that's available for it. Um, and I think, I, think, I think many people look at a, a career, a life in the entertainment industry, in the artistic world, um, and you see the people who are, who are, who are able to manage to, to rise to the top and find a way through. And I think, I think it is that doggedness in a way and, and that determination and, and that belief that you'll find a way. Well, and here's the other thing that I learned early on. One of my dear teachers, um, Julie Ariola, who's one of my acting teachers, a sort of mentor, a dear, dear friend, taught me very early on if this is the thing you want to do, and I'm speaking about my career as an actor, you know, I was talking earlier about the times when you know, you're not auditioning so much, maybe you weren't acting so much. Is this something you would be willing to do if nobody paid you? Meaning, is this something that if nobody were looking, if there were no reward, but it makes your heart sing, would you want to do it? And my answer was always yes. And if my answer was yes, then let me get to it. If my answer was no, then yeah, I might pivot and try something else. But for me, the answer was always yes. And I've applied that way of thinking to pretty much everything I've chosen to pursue. I knew when I wrote the book, maybe only 50 people or 500 people would read the book. Was that going to stop me from writing it? No. I had to do it because I was called to do it because that's in that, I guess, conversation with my own interior life and my own heart. That is something that maybe my parents didn't teach me that <laughs> per se, but that I somehow learned along the way. And I found other teachers to teach me that. And I had something I tried to, you know, Elizabeth Gilbert says it in a different way. She says like, she calls it the eating the shit, uh, the shit sandwiches, like is this something, you're gonna to have to eat a bunch of shit sandwiches to get to the thing you want. And are you willing to eat the shit sandwich? I mean, that's a very, I, I love that way of looking at it. And maybe if you don't wanna eat this shit sandwich, then don't do it. But if you do, don't begrudge that, you know that's what you're doing. You're eating the shit sandwich. I mean, uh, yeah. And I'll, I'll tell you, Tim, in, in all complete candor and honesty, um, when I was acting, I wasn't willing to eat that sandwich. Yeah. What I'm doing now, I'm willing to eat it because <laughs> I'm a little older, I'm a little wiser, but also think we we come into what is ours yeah. when it is our time. Yes. And I think you found that space within yourself from a very young age. And I think I think that was always and has always been the the X factor within you and your success mm -hmm. is that you had that awareness you know we were doing plays in high school you weren't right does that make sense what i'm saying i think i think i know what you mean that i was i was uh, yes I, I i know what you mean um and and i i will say also that what you're helping me see in this conversation which is why i love talking to you is you're helping my my brain is now connecting that aspect and i think as you're suggesting, it's a core part of who I am that I don't always acknowledge or, you know, pinpoint or name. But that part of served me well mm. for the 10 years Sato was sick and I was a caregiver. Yeah. 
And I remember trying to explain that to someone like, I don't know, um, he said I was still alive. So it's, it's, it's it, you know, a decade ago. Um, when I was trying to say how, and I, at the time I called it how my actor helped me be a better caregiver. And I was trying to talk about like how the tenaciousness, there's the word again, how that kind of doggedness, that sort of like, you know, don't give up approach that show up even in the face of uncertainty. Those are all things you learn as an actor. Like as an actor, you know, you know, you're starting out in New York and you got to have like four changes of clothes for the day. You're going to be on the train. You're going to be changing clothes here and there. You're going to get up. I mean, you can't like, you have to be nimble you have to be able to like be fluid about life. So it sort of teaches you fluidity, which I think they call it now the pivot, the pandemic and quarantine is taught as everybody the great pivot. But you know, that's just a part of being like an actor on the street auditioning every day. But I think if I back that up a little bit, I think I had some of that before I was an actor. And I think that's what you're trying to suggest to me. Yeah, that, 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 that is the suggestion. Yeah, and, and okay, 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 I accept, I accept, thank you. <laughs> um, I hear you, duly noted, um, but you know, and, and, I, and I say that because when I do talk to people about caregiving, which is something I'm also very passionate about, and it's something I do advocacy work around, um, that there is a way that you are asked, and we all know it now because we're living in the, in the pandemic, to show up every day not knowing and mm. still give it your all. Still bring the best of who you are, the best of what you're capable of on that day. Because right, it looks different day to day. And just show up and show up for another person. And that's what I spent a decade doing, you know, and, and what I read about it a lot in the book. You know, um, and and um, I think that that I can see now that that is something that is inherent to me. But I don't think it's 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 something that's learnable. I don't think it's like a you know. Yeah, I think. <laughs> Maybe I hadn't thought about. It. I don't know. I'm, I'm, it's coming to me now, so I don't have you know. Right. Are you comfortable with the term as it applies to you, artist? I am. I am. I live an artful life. I know that about myself now. Mm. My sister makes fun of me because here's the, this is, so we, when we started the production office, we were each given an office space at the studio on the lot where we we're going to be filming from scratch. Within 48 hours, my office space was set up. I had stuff on the walls, I had my orchids, I had all my things, right? I had all my things because I need my things, right? And I was like, okay, I can be here now. Go down the hall to my sister and she's got, you know, an empty coffee cup, <laughs> like, you know, a box in the corner and she's like, let's go. And she talked, she said, look at my sister's office. Like, that's how she's like, who does that right like and apparently little known secret to me because I have never been a screenwriter prior to this experience screenwriters don't typically decorate their offices at work because for whatever reason they feel like if I could get fired next week I want to just be able to walk out with my computer so they don't take the time to decorate I did not know this I did not get this memo and by the way even if I got the memo I would not care because I'm like I'm here now and I'm using it so even if it, if I get fired I get fired but I'll I'll take the hour and a half it takes to you know gather everything up but I'm not gonna live here in half measure I'm not gonna be half in half out I'm going to commit to this and stake my claim, plant my flag. This is my space. But not, not only for that, but also because it gives me joy. Because when I walk in here, I want to feel happy. So that's what I mean about when you ask me, do I take the term artist? I think you can live an artful life and it can look a lot of different ways. Yes. And that doesn't mean a paintbrush to a canvas necessarily. Right. Right. There's, there's a way, there's a kind of artistry to living. There's an art to friendship. There's an art to love. There's an art to mothering. There's an art to being a friend. There's an art to teaming. There is a kind of artfulness to being human if you want to do it in a fulfilled, authentic, connected way. And I choose to do that. So yes, I'm an artist. I, I, you know, I'm making all of these connections right now. Um, 
my friend Toby Poser, who you may have met, um, an actress. I think that I, Toby briefly, briefly, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, you know, our lives don't always cross in, in certain yeah. ways, but she 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 graciously sat with us and, and she said at one one point, and it's it's you're re, you're reflecting back what she said, but she said that you can find creativity anywhere. You can right. find creativity in the setting and the rising of the sun. And it literally took my breath away. I think people conflate or want to link up often um, the essential human desire. Listen, we live in a creative generative force created all of this. We are a part of an ecosystem as, our, as human beings who are evolving and whether we know it or not, that is, that is what we are, we are part of a creative energetic force in the universe, right? We, we, we're, we exist within that. But I think what people do sometimes is they want to conflate, they want to assign professionalism to something and that's where they bump on this idea of artistry. So I'm taking a more broader comprehensive approach than just like what you do as a job or as a career. You know, uh, and I'm saying what your friend Toby said, that there is a kind of artfulness and a creativity that has a broad applications for how we choose to be with each other, mm. for the sun rising or setting, um, you know, and sometimes as a dear friend of mine, Josh Allen, who's a brilliant writer, and screenwriter, has <laughs> said, um, and there are people who find a way to monetize that creativity <laughs> and create jobs from it. And that's another thing. But they're not, they're not mutually exclusive. You know what I mean? You can, you, they start from the same place. Some people just choose to take that and uh, you know, employ that in their creative lives and in their professional, sorry, professional lives. Timby, you've called Attica's name. You've called Julie's name. Who, who what are the names? <laughs> My roll call, I got a roll call. Well, first of all, you're one of the names. You're one of my names. I remember when you sat down with me, I was, you know, boots a shaken when I had the idea of um, starting a, a platform that I launched, I want to say 27, 15, 16. So some six odd years ago, maybe more. Um, um, the Kitchen Widow, which at the time, you know, which is like a sort of a precursor to the book. I didn't know I was going to write a book when I started that. But that was me sort of saying, hey, I got all these creative tools. There's this thing I know. There's this big life experience that I've had. How can I use my creativity to express that? And I remember sitting down with you with sort of like loose ideas of what that might be. And you very succinctly were like, Timmy, this is from the outside looking, looking in. This is what I see. And your name, we've talked a lot about naming today, but your calling that really helped me <clears throat> to say, oh, yeah, I am an artist. I am an actor. Paul Crump is one of the names. You'll know that name. He was our uh, high school theater teacher. My, I call forth my ancestors a lot because the deep, the women in my life in my both um, matrilineal and patrilineal lines. Ooh, baby. I mean, talk about some fierce, grounded, forward thinking will lift you up um, women. I mean, they just, you know, they had an understanding that the best of who they are and who they were could best serve the world by being shared into another person. Like, like I, I'm not saying, I like, meaning they, they, they sort of, they had, they were in on the secret. <laughs> that the secret of a good life <laughs> isn't so much about all the stuff you do for you, but it's about what are you seeding forward? They somehow knew that. So I remember coming into the room as a little person, like seven or eight, and they'd be like, sit right here and tell me what's going on in your world. I mean, would talk to me like we were peers. And I mean, I say that lovingly because you know, black, most black women did, not as peers per se, but like that they saw me as the woman I would be and they were modeling for me 
how do you see a child in whole for their wholeness, right? And, and that was powerful. And so I called them forward because they <clears throat> were teaching me, they were saying, they were sharing a kind of wisdom with me. They were in bringing me into a hold. Um, and, and I think that, you know, I don't, it, this came into my mind right now. I hadn't thought about this before, but to a degree, that's a part of the relationship I found with Sato's mom after he passed. That's a part of what I read about in From Scratch is I found that same sort of feeling with my mother-in-law in a different language, in a different country, you know, ocean and continent apart. But it was that same, like, come here, come here. Let me, let me, let's talk. Let me show you through something that you don't yet know. And I hope that as, you know, my years go forward, that I do the same thing in small and large ways with others. Mm. My child, people, you know, maybe through my work. It's one thing I hope for. Mm. I want to ask you what moment, what decision, what choice in your life was your biggest leap of faith? Ooh, um, I've had a few, but you want me to do only one? Because I feel like, you know, okay. Listen. Well, I, <laughs> uh, I will say the first one was definitely the, the choice to go to Italy. That was, um, for me, from where I came from, from the family I had, from where I was in my life at that time, to go for the first time, leave the country, um, with a passport that barely had the ink dry on it <laughs> and to go to a country that I didn't know the length, all of that stuff as a black woman in my, you know, when I was 20 years old and nobody were well, like, my parents were like, wait, what's happening? Um, that was a leap. And of course we know how that changed the trajectory of my life. Um, Becoming a mom, choosing to become a parent, and the way I became a parent through adoption, the decision, all the decisions that led up to that leap, huge leap. And then, of course, um, the leap to write this book. I think, you know, those are three huge, huge ones. Timby Locke, thank you so much. We thank did you. it? We did it. We oh, did it. This is so lovely. I can't tell you what this means. Oh, I hope I I I I I hope it um has served your work. Um, because I believe so deeply in the work that you're doing and this library of thinkers and this library of conversations that you are collecting, you are paying it forward. You are seeding a lot by bringing these voices together to talk about these moments of change, these moments of saying yes, these the hardships that have yielded something beautiful. Mm. When we transmute, when we transmute our pain, when mm. we transmute the no, when we do that, when we show people how it's done, when we talk about it, changes changes mm -hmm. lives. I can I I can I I can can see it now, and I know it. And you're doing it, so I'm honored to be a part of it. Thank you. Yeah, me too. Thank you. This is a beautiful legacy. Thank you. Thank you. To those of you who are watching or listening, remember we all have a voice. Use yours wisely. Thank you.